Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Peter Kluson, and I'm a uh, scientific vice president of the European uh, Federation of Chemical Engineering. I'm very glad that we have this great opportunity to meet one another on one of the very, very important topic of uh, uh, chemical engineering or, or materials engineering organized by a working party on mechanics of particle solids. And I'm glad that I may welcome here Diego Barleda, uh, who is Diego is uh, a chair of this working party. And we have a special topic today, characterization and modeling of particle solids flow for industrial processes. Diego will talk about uh, the working party and about the meeting today uh, in more details in, in a couple of minutes. Uh, <clears throat> I'm, I'd like to express my thanks to all of you who registered because that's important uh, having the audience. I'd like to express my thanks to, the, to Diego and to both our speakers and also to Professor Martin Pook from University of Toulouse, who is, uh, uh, who is a, a director of the Secretariat of uh, Scientific Secretariat of EFCE. Maybe Martin, I'd like to ask you now for uh, uh, just uh, the slide. Uh, I, I'd like to take the opportunity to invite you to another event, which is organized by European Federation of Chemical Engineering in basically two weeks time. In the beginning of uh, December, 5th of December, we are opening uh, or we are starting activities of a completely new section of uh, EFCE, which is called Chemical Engineering as Applied to Medicine. It reflects uh, very modern needs and requirements of the field uh, because chemical engineering is not only uh, the field in which we, let's say, make batch systems continuous for pharmaceutical industry, but there are definitely uh, areas which are very, very close to, to medic medicine applications, and uh, it, it, it appeared that it would deserve an, a separate section. So I, I cordially invite all of you who are interested in applications of chemical engineering um, in, in medicine to, to take part, to register, and enjoy it together with us. So maybe this is, this is all from me, and now I'm, I'm, I'm passing the stage to, uh, to, to Diego who is going to introduce you more about the today's uh, Spotlight talk. Thanks a lot. Good afternoon uh, to everyone. Uh, my name is Diego Barletta. I want first of all to thank uh, the European Federation of Chemical Engineering uh, for offering this platform uh, for sharing uh, knowledge and uh, science. And uh, especially want to thank uh, Professor Cluson and Professor Poo for the uh, organization of this uh, series. Uh, just let me say a few words about the working party on mechanics of particulate solids that uh, today I have the privilege to represent. The aim uh, of this working party is one of the scientific group of the European Federation is to promote uh, science, education and technology transfer in the subject area of bath solids handling uh, and uh, transportation. The scientific group is formed by um, university scholars and industrial practitioners active in the field, uh, in especially in Europe, uh, but is also open to the guest participation of non-European uh, guests. So uh, the, the activities of the group are somehow reported in uh, the website that you can uh, eventually uh, visit. Uh, that is uh, accessible from the uh, web page of the European uh, Federation of Chemical Engineering, uh, in which we will see some of uh, our activities. But uh, let me uh, focus uh, the uh, attention uh, uh, on the program uh, we have today. So basically, we will have two lectures. Uh, the first uh, will be on characterization methods of uh, powder flowability and will be delivered by Professor Massimo Poletto. Uh, from University uh, of Salerno. And the second will be on DM modeling particulate solid processes from model conceptualization to industrial application by Professor Jean Oy from University of Edinburgh. Uh, just let me say that, uh, of course, there will be a way to uh, somehow interrupt uh, at the end uh, of the uh, presentation. 
during the presentation and immediately after, you can pose your question in the question and answer section session uh, in the in the chat, uh, and uh, I will uh, uh, convey your question at the end to to the speaker. So with that, uh, I want to, to give the word uh, to Professor Massimo Poletto, who is a professor of uh, chemical engineering in the Department of Industrial Engineering of the University uh, of Salerno, Italy. Please, Massimo, the floor is yours. Thank you, Diego. Thank you to everybody. It's a real honor to, uh, to be here for this, uh, for this talk. Uh, that uh, is on characterization method of other <coughs> flowability. I hope you you can see my screen. So um, uh, before uh, starting, uh, um, I want to say that um, most of the content of this uh, talk uh, are based on a common uh, work <coughs> that was carried out with uh, Professor Andrea uh, Santomas of the University of Padova and Professor Diego Barletta of uh, University of Salerno. And that I want to acknowledge so the contribute their contribution to the uh, to this work and to what I will uh, say in the next uh, minutes. So uh, you all know that when we speak about powders, uh, um, <clears throat> uh, they may behave differently under flow, and I think they all, all experience a difference in uh, emptying a sachet of uh, of sugar and one of flour, and that the two have a completely different behavior. So at the base of that, uh, <clears throat> mostly the, the, there are interparticle uh, forces that are also responsible for the agglomeration behavior that you see here. Interparticle forces that can be uh, of several kinds, uh, mostly frictional, van der Waals, capillary, electrostatics. And I mean, the, the time today does not allow to uh, enter into detail of that, uh, but perhaps it's, it's is um, it's good to remember that the significance of this force uh, uh, depend on the relative value of this of their intensity with respect to the weight of the of the particle. Uh, there is the bond numbers which uh, define uh, this. That is the, the ratio between the interparticle force and the, and the weight of the particle. And what is interesting is in that is that uh, uh, while most of the forces uh, depends on linearly or um, close to linear to the uh, to the particle size the weight instead depends with the uh, third power of the particle size and so <clears throat> this means that when the particle size is decreasing the bond number uh, this bond number will would, would increase would increase and may increase up to hundreds or thousands values of, of such uh, entity uh, <clears throat> And in this case, we have uh, cohesive uh, powders, uh, which tend to flow uh, harder. So uh, the, um, but this is not the only uh, things that is happening. So another thing that uh, is important is how this particle organize and uh, uh, relate uh, with, with each other through these uh, uh, interparticle forces. So if you have a loose uh, system, you can have few uh, interconnection activated, but when you, compact the, the powder, you may have uh, activate more of these uh, uh, of these bonds and so this will uh, provide a more compact uh, system uh, with higher strength and less prone to flowability. And uh, if you let time go or if you have uh, stresses acting on the system, you, you can also have an increase of the strength uh, of this uh, of this bond. So, why this is important? Because all the system uh, which are used to measure powder flowability uh, have to somehow cancel the, the this historical effect that you can uh, can build on on the powder uh, in order to have uh, repeatable and reliable uh, measurements. Uh, <clears throat> so mm, they uh, all. Uh, uh, have, have a, a, a step which uh, uh, is devoted to that and other uh, systems uh, some of these uh, procedure for uh, measurement uh, the, the powder flow properties also are able to induce a certain definite uh, compaction and consolidation uh, <clears throat> so that the the flow uh, the, 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 the the flow properties are measured in the in the right consolidation stage so 
say that uh, uh, I would use this classification of, uh, of um, characterization method for methods for powder probability. So the first cl uh, class would be of static methods that is made uh, by those uh, systems in which the powder is uh, brought to a certain kind of flow, then the flow is stopped and the flow ability is measured according to a property of the final status of the, of the powder at the end of the flow. Dynamic methods instead are those in which the characteristic that is related uh, more or less directly to powder flow ability is measured while the flow is occurring. And then uh, we have the final consolidation methods that are methods uh, in which the first the, the, the system is consolidated to the right value. And then um, <clears throat> another step is done in order to bring the, the, the powder to failure. And so <clears throat> measure the uh, quantify the, the strength of the powder in this in this way. Um, Generally, this method also uh, associated with uh, uh, slow uh, deformation velocities. So let's start with the static method. Uh, and uh, one of the most popular is the measurement of, uh, of bulk density or through bulk density. Uh, the relationship between flowability and bulk density uh, it goes through the fact that uh, <clears throat> flowability is related to particle mobility and particle mobility is related to the packing propensity of the, of the particle uh, that in turn is related to the uh, bulk density of, of, of the system. So uh, the idea behind this, uh, this method is that if you uh, generate or pour the, pour the powder uh, uh, in a container, the first uh, density will be a loose density or uh, if there are interparticle forces, you will have a loose density, which is um, affected by the interparticle forces. And that, uh, however, if you put vibration or uh, tapping, uh, or you tap the material, what you have is that uh, the, the, the energy that you put into the system allows the particle to uh, overcome the local barriers of energy and uh, reach uh, uh, more compacted uh, stage. So in the end, uh, the variation of density between the initial stage to the final, it's an indication of the powder flow ability. So there are several index which use the uh, pore density and the tapper density, like the acceleration that you see, the compressibility index or the care index, all depends on this couple of, uh, of densities and all <clears throat> are um, uh, organized such that uh, 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 an increase of the value would uh, correspond to a decrease of the powder uh, flowability. So in order to estimate any of these index, uh, uh, it is necessary to have a, a way, a repeatable way to measure the, uh, the power density and the tapper density. And so and the procedure generally adopt uh, strategies so that the uh, final value of the density that is generated is less dependent on as possible on the initial stage of the state status of the powder and also on the hands of the uh, operator. So for example, the simplest way is to use a funnel. <clears throat> so the, the powder is flows down into a cap, fills it, and then uh, the cap is of no, no, known volume. You can uh, eliminate the excess powder and based on the, on the mass uh, of the powder contained the cap, you can uh, uh, evaluate the, uh, uh, the density. Uh, you can change the setup for uh, uh, doing this, but the principle is always uh, uh, the same. And similar is also the procedure for the tap at density. So in this case, however, uh, while tapping, we have to ensure that uh, the, 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 the cap will have some other material to be filled. So what is done is to use an extension cap uh, that is uh, filled by the funnel, then you have the tapping. And at the end of the tapping, you remove the extension, you remove the excess of powder, and again, you have um, a fixed volume all, and you have to measure only the mass of it. Of course, there is an alternative to this and to use a single uh, graduated cylinder like this, which has the great advantage of uh, using one, one parameter, one only container for uh, both porous and uh, and uh, tapped density. 
uh, the the problem with the use of graduated cylinder and which uh, in general is uh, should be discouraged is that uh, uh, it's difficult to precisely detect the the, the level of uh, of the material inside the cylinder because of the tendency of powder on this on not having a very clear uh, surface of course in order to compare result uh, you need uh, as i said a standardized procedure because there are many parameters that may change and so <clears throat> several uh, standardized procedures are, are uh, available for different uh, materials you can see here another approach uh, which allows and, and maybe is uh, more uh, sensitive uh, <clears throat> for uh, intermediate uh, immediate uh, for on sorry on on, on the range uh, on wider range of uh, powder flowability is the angle of repose the angle of repose would be the angle of the heap uh, that is formed by pouring the powder over a table and uh, <clears throat> this angle uh, practically co coincide with the uh, angle of internal friction for uh, free flowing powder but when you add cohesion this is not anymore uh, true and the final angle would strongly depend on uh, on the procedure that uh, you have adopted uh, to generate uh, uh, the heap uh, so the sales procedure are different so you can use procedure in which you can fix uh, the height of the heap by fixing the height of the hopper which uh, generates uh, the, the, the hips itself or you can uh, fix the base of the hip and then you measure the height in order to uh, estimate the angle and or you can empty a shallow container and measure the the angle of the, the remaining uh, material and or measure the angle of spatula. So all these methods provide very similar results for uh, free flowing powder. Instead, uh, the results tend to be dependent on the method uh, for, uh, for cohesive powders. Another method is the sliding, uh, is the tilting container in which uh, uh, the container is still to the uh, sliding of the uh, in content of the container itself. Uh, it's possible also to use dynamic method uh, to measure the angle uh, um, of repose and uh, this for, for example with a rotating gram you can measure angles uh, <clears throat> uh, of the material in the rotating gram uh, uh, and the angle would depend of, in this case on the rotation velocity so at very low rotation velocity what you have is uh, that the material flows uh, as a sequence of avalanches so this means that uh, uh, as the avalanche starts, you have a maximum value of the angle, then the materials flow down, you reach the lower value of the angle, and then you have to wait that the rotation of the drum brings again the surface to the highest possible angle to, for the next, uh, uh, for the next uh, uh, avalanche. At higher velocity, instead, you have a quite regular flow and you have a dynamic uh, uh, angle which is uh, generally uh, included or is an, uh, close, close to the average of the two uh, maximum minimum angle, angle in the avalanche regime. Uh, this kind of measurement of course is ideal uh, for ranking powders uh, flowability and uh, it's useful for uh, powder control. But when you apply this method to cohesive uh, powder, especially the, uh, the drum, uh, requires some strategies to, to estimate the, the powder flowability because the, the surface can be very rough or very different from, from a line. Another thing that is possible to do with this system is to analyze uh, the uh, sequence of avalanches through statistical methods. And but unfortunately, there's not much time to enter into details of this. So some of the apparatus that you find uh, all on the Mac is this uh, ground run. And uh, also they have a proprietary uh, procedure to estimate uh, the surface and to evaluate, uh, to, to derive from that the properties of the powder. So other <clears throat> dynamic methods are, uh, for example, variable or if it's um, uh, hoppers. Uh, you can have uh, cylindrical hoppers, uh, cylindrical containers, as the one here, or uh, funnel containers, uh, the one here. Uh, and what you can measure is either 
uh, what is the minimum orifice in order to uh, avoid uh, a formation of an arch which uh, uh, hinders the uh, powder flow or another things that you can measure is the time necessary for uh, uh, discharging the, the powder. In this respect, uh, especially in this last, uh, uh, it's different. The, the two kind of geometry provide different features because in, in the kind of uh, cylindrical, hopper, uh, uh, cylindrical hoppers, the kind of flow, which is called the uh, funnel flow, which is not to be confused with the funnel uh, geometry, but the funnel flow is a flow in which you have an internal friction. Uh, you activate uh, an internal shear plane uh, in the powder, and so is the internal friction, which uh, really uh, play, makes uh, plays a role. While if you have a um, higher, um, <clears throat> while well, in the other case you uh, tend to activate the, the wall friction can be can be significant in the system and the result. Uh, so all these systems are uh, suitable and uh, work. Uh, 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 fairly well for uh, relative free flowing material and maybe not adequate for uh, highly cohesive material. And also in this case, there are standards to be referred to in case you want to use those. Other kind of, of uh, measure set up in the dynamic regime are uh, rheometers, in which you have an impeller, uh, which is rotating inside a bed, uh, which can be cylindrical or can have other shapes like, uh, for example, a two blade shape. And you can measure the torque uh, under different conditions for aeration of the of the powder. And what is the problem of this is that the the the, um, the stresses that act at the level of the impeller are dependent on a lot of parameters such as the depth of the impeller, the um, the kind of aeration that you're putting, and uh, what friction. And in general, there's not much standardization on the use of this uh, kind of uh, setup. Uh, um, it has to be said, however, that uh, these are becoming quite popular and are used in scientific uh, uh, studies uh, to, to approach the mechanics of uh, powder beds in aerated, aerated and fluidized condition. And the very interesting thing of uh, rheometer is that they can explore uh, shearing regime at very uh, wide range of, uh, of shear and flow. And so uh, I think that uh, the potential of this, uh, of this setup is uh, not uh, yet uh, fully explored and, uh, as a future, I think. So this a setup that is commercially available by Anton Parr and the different uh, impellers uh, shapes. And this is what you can measure, for example, with a two blade impeller, different depth. <clears throat> And uh, it is what you, the, the value of the, how it changes with the impeller depth and uh, different aeration rate with different, uh, different material, just to give you an idea of what can be done. A uh, few words on the Freeman uh, rheometer, because it's uh, for sure one of the most popular. It makes use of a proprietary impeller, which has a twisted blade, which is moved in helical uh, uh, direction and always pushing the, Material in the, with the with the blade in the mm, more in, in the wider position, and what you can measure with this uh, this kind of setup is the uh, energy, the work done by the impeller to uh, penetrate to to the system. In case we speak about flow energy, or the work done from the impeller to release uh, and to exit out of the system. In this system, in this case, we we speak about specific energy. The procedure in this case is standardized. You have uh, the whole uh, cycle is, uh, is made of 11, uh, uh, 11 uh, steps, eight at the uh, highest velocity at, and repeating exactly the same, uh, same condition. And the last three steps instead at uh, increasingly low uh, uh, velocity of the, of the blade. And from these uh, steps and the energy calculated in these steps, uh, you, you, you can evaluate different uh, indexes, uh, which are related to the flowability of the powder in general, but also on the ability of the powder to, uh, on the repeatability of the experiment and on the dependency of the measurement uh, on the rotational velocity. So um, I would 
spend the last minute of my presentation looking at the defined and consolidation method. These were developed for silo design and uh, are linked to the phenomena that occur in silo flow. So <clears throat> in order to fully understand this, uh, one should enter into the theory of silo design, which of course is not the purpose of this, uh, of this uh, talk. So uh, I will uh, tell you some of the main features. So one of the things you want to avoid when you design a silo is formation of arches, like the one shown here of material, which uh, avoid the, the flow of the material or uh, formation of pipes, uh, so-called rattles like this. And what is common between pipes and rattles is the formation of a free surface of some material in which the strength of material is high enough to resist to the tendency of the powder to flow out of, of the system. So <clears throat> uh, from the analysis of the statics of the, uh, of the arch, uh, it comes out that the arch is stable when the strength of the material is larger than these forces acting on the arch uh, um, are lower than this strength. So uh, <clears throat> in principle, this, uh, this parameter can be uh, calculated with a uniaxial testing procedure in which you, for example, confine the material into a container, you compress it, then you uh, take out the walls of the container and you compress it again uh, till breakage. So the <clears throat> by plotting the it's possible to plot the unconfined yield strength. So the the, the sigma c that you obtain from the second experiment uh, as a function of the compression uh, stress, and you obtain the plot function. And the plot function and this the, the <clears throat> is at the base of the measurement of the estimation of power flowability according to Jenike. Actually, what the genic is to introduce the flow factor, which is the ratio between the consolidation stress and the strength of the material. So uh, it's uh, <clears throat> the inverse of the slope of a line, which is uh, uh, passes through the origin of the FC versus sigma one uh, uh, plane uh, represented here. So if the flow function fall is a range in which the flow factor is uh, larger than 10 is said to be free flowing is the flow function is uh, as flow factors between four and eight, uh, then uh, the um, material is said to be easy flowing, then cohesive if, 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 if it is between two and four, very cohesive between one and two and harder than uh, for values harder, larger than one. So it means that the strength is larger than the uh, stress used to strengthen the, the powder which is quite unlikely. But uh, <clears throat> one important thing I have to say here is that the procedure to calculate the strength of the powder and the, the flow function, all the procedure, whatever you use, are independent of, of gravity. Um, and depends only on the cohesivity, cohesivity of the material. <clears throat> so uh, the classification here has the same uh, kind of classification, which is you get the same kind of features, so which is an advantage is because uh, you can use this this classification of powder even if you want to build a silo, for example, on the surface of the moon or the su surface of March, where the uh, gravity is completely different. But as this advantage that does not allow to uh, to compare powder in their behavior. Uh, in, uh, for example, in, in flow in silos, existing silos uh, under the action of gravity alone, because what is missing is the um, information regarding density. So you can have two powders which have exactly the same flow function, but uh, if one is lighter than the other, it will flow much more, uh, more with much more difficulty out of, of a hopper than, uh, than the first one. And so you, <clears throat> it's better in this case, if you want to have indication on the propensity of flow uh, in under gravity to use other parameter than the classification of Jenike, like uh, for example, the opening of a silo, uh, the critical opening of a silo, which is derived from the Jenike theory. So these are some example of measurement of uh, uniaxial shear testing. Uh, by applying uh, the weight, this is by applying the strain, and as you can see here, the the, the breakage occurs at, at the bottom. And this this is uh, depends from the fact that uh, there is an effect of the walls of the material, 
uh, that can be corrected if you know the flow property of the material, uh, but uh, of course it's not practical if you want to use this uh, parameter, this, this uh, the procedure for measuring the flow function. Uh, <clears throat> but uh, what it can be done is to develop a system in which the, um, uh, the, the wall, uh, the effect of the wall shear can be uh, can be um, reduced. This is what happens, for example, in this uh, Edinburgh powder flow tester, uh, in which has movable uh, walls. And so this allow to reduce the uh, contribution and the reduction of the stress in, in the depth of the bed with the, uh, in the compression stage of the, of the mold. So uh, the other way to uh, produce the, the, the flow function is uh, by means of uh, direct shear tester. The, so the, the ancestor of the shear tester is the Jenica shear tester, which is made like this by a cap, a ring, and the lead. Uh, the material is, is put inside the, the system. Uh, the lead is used to apply a certain normal load to the powder and uh, realize a certain normal stress on the plane, uh, that is the shearing plane between the ring and the, and the cup. And the ring is moved in order to uh, uh, impress a, a, a certain shear movement to the, to the system. So the procedure is made of, as, as always, of two steps. We have a consolidation step in which uh, you apply a normal stress and you shear the powder till uh, the value of the <clears throat> Uh, shear stress is constant, uh, and this uh, uh, is useful because it ensures a univocal relationship between the normal stress applied and the kind of consolidation that is, has been reached by the powder. And then after the, that is done, you release, you lower uh, the normal stress and you measure uh, the value of the tangential stress that is necessary uh, to uh, bring to failure the, the system. And this provides a value of the yield. Of course, this procedure can be repeated uh, <clears throat> with other uh, samples in the, in the cell uh, several times in order to obtain other points of the, what is called the yield locus. In this case, uh, uh, it's linear, not always like that, but in this case, it's linear. And uh, so the yield locus is characterized by the angle of internal friction phi and by the cohesion that is the intercept of the yield locus with the axis. The point representative of shear stress can be used to uh, estimate the state of, of the, the state of stress during shearing, <clears throat> and uh, first of all to calculate the major principal stress in in this stage that should correspond to the stress that was used in the uniaxial testing for uh, measuring the flow uh, function. And the unconfined yield strength would be determined by using the more circular representative, the unconfined yield. And so <clears throat> using the unconfined yield strength and sigma one that is calculated like that is possible also here to have a point of the flow function. And by repeating this procedure several times with different value of the pre shear stress is possible to draw the whole, the entire flow function. Uh, the problem with the genic shear tester is that it's, uh, it's a bit complicated. It takes several parts, uh, which is difficult to handle. But the really serious problem is that it's uh, the strain which is possible to apply is limited. And so even to uh, reach a, a pre-shear, it's necessary to uh, carry out complex procedure with the twisting and things. So, Due to this uh, limitation, uh, have uh, uh, this has uh, strongly um, pushed towards the development and the use of a rotational tester, which instead uh, do not have uh, such uh, such limits, and also depend uh, all the hoop procedure depends much less on the operator. And now most of the uh, setups that are available commercially are also quite fully automated. So the really the um, the effect of the operator is uh, the, 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 yeah is, is quite limited. So this this is the Schultz uh, tester in which you have a rotating trough here, and the lead is kept uh, in position by two tie rods that measure the torque that is necessary to keep it steady, and the lead is also used to apply uh, weights 
by uh, 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 in order to uh, uh, act a normal uh, uh, a normal stress on the shearing surface that is on the anodes. This is the Schulze tester, and this is the way we have modified the Schulze tester to to consider the effect of temperature. And these are some of the yellow guys that we measured uh, uh, looking at the effect of temperature here in the University of, uh, of Salerno. Um, oh, other setups can measure the, uh, are equipped for measuring shear, uh, to do shear testing, or the same Freeman uh, apparatus has a head which allows uh, to uh, reproduce the shear testing in a fully automated way. Uh, there is the Brookfield shear test, which is also very, very uh, fr uh, friendly in the use, <clears throat> uh, which um, can be used. And also this uh, rheometer. And also we have the uh, Anton Pass shear set. It does also the, um, the Owen to measure the, um, uh, the shear properties at uh, controlled temperature and humidity. I have to say that all uh, uh, rheometer-based um, uh, shear tester, uh, with respect to the Schulze, uh, have the difference that uh, uh, do not apply the normal load uh, by means of applying a force, but they adjust the force by regulating the position of the uh, uh, of the lead. So these are some some flow functions that we, we obtain on the uh, Antonpar shear test at different temperature. And uh, these are uh, flow function in which only temperature is changing. So it shows that uh, this in fact is a quite important parameter to be accounted for. So <clears throat> I came to a hand of my procedure. Unfortunately, there's no, on my, on my sorry, presentation. Uh, I could not present many other tests which are uh, interesting and may have uh, some especially interesting future like vibrated flow tensor strength and the indentation strength or the um, warren spring uh, procedure uh, so but i would like to conclude that uh, different method for measuring part of flowability are available the, the factor that should guide the choice are the purpose, why you want to measure the flowability, what kind of flow you you are uh, uh, you want to uh, predict, or flowability you want to predict, uh, what is the degree of consolidation of the powder in your flow, and what is the powder cohesiveness. All this should be taken into account. The choice, uh, unfortunately, the factors that always do guide the choice are the ease of use and the budget available, but uh, as a researcher, maybe you can combine uh, combine the two. And I want to finish my talk now, but just by putting a, a table which summarize all the features that we have said before. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Massimo, for uh, this uh, comprehensive uh, review of the methods. Uh, I just want to uh, remind the audience uh, that uh, it is possible uh, to ask a question by typing them, and uh, I will later uh, post to the, to the, to the speaker. Uh, for the time being, it seems that we have, uh, okay, we have, we have, uh, uh, we have a first, uh, uh, question that I will ask uh, Massimo uh, is uh, uh, do methods exist uh, uh, to predict the flowability of mixture only by measured data of single mixture components? Uh, so, you, uh, so, sorry, can you repeat? Uh, yeah, of you... course, of course. The, the, the question is do methods exist to predict the flowability of mixtures? only by measured data of single mixture components. Uh, I, I actually am not aware of, uh, of that, actually. Sorry. <laughs> I, don't, I don't think it's easy also because uh, uh, the interaction between the two phases can be quite uh, complicated and uh, for sure it's not never is. I mean, the, the behavior is uh, quite complex, especially if the two uh, components are very different in, uh, in size. Uh, the resulting flowability may be a completely non-linear combination of the flowability of the two of the two components. Thank you, Massimo. Um, 
Okay, then, then there is a question about the, the availability of uh, the presentation slide, but I think that these uh, talks will be recorded and so will be also available uh, on a proper channel of the European Federation of Chemical Engineering. Uh, just another uh, scientific question instead. Uh, what about segregation in shear tester during uh, filling uh, or operation? Yeah, this is, a, uh, this is a very good question and it's, a, it's really a challenge. I mean, because uh, if there is something that is very, very difficult to, to eliminate when you have any, any flow is uh, segregation. So if you have highly segregating powder, it's, it's really, really a challenge to, to avoid that during filling. I think that in that case, maybe if, if you are able to find a way to, to, to mix the powder, then I would use a, a method in which there is not much flow involved. So for example, a, a shear testing uh, procedure or you know, actual testing procedure, I would have devised that. For sure, not, not using method in which you have, uh, you activate a, a, an intense flow. Okay, so thank you also for this uh, answer. Um, so I uh, would proceed with the second talk and eventually if you have additional question for Massimo, you can continue uh, typing and I will try to find some time at the end also to, to continue this uh, discussion. So uh, now it is my pleasure to introduce uh, our second speaker today. Uh, is uh, Professor Jean Oi, who is Professor of Particulate Solid Mechanics at the University of uh, Edinburgh. Uh, I also mm, did not mention to, that both Massimo and Jean are both uh, quali well qualified members of the working party of Mechanics of Particulate Solids. So I will uh, uh, give the word to, to Jean for uh, his presentation on. Uh, uh, the modeling approach uh, for a particular process. So while the first presentation were more focused on the experimental characterization, the second one will be instead on modeling. Please, Jean. Thank you very much, Diago. Can you hear me? It's okay? Yes, perfectly. Thank you. So may I start by, uh, first of all, thanking um, your brain practitioner and chemical engineers colleagues for the invitation and the opportunity to, to uh, to, uh, for this talk and to uh, Professor Diago Paletto, the chairman of our working party, uh, for proposing this, uh, this talk on the characterization and modeling of particular solids for industrial processes. So I think in my talk, uh, with that title for this session, I'm wanting to share some of the, uh, I think the journey that, that we have been on in, uh, in Edinburgh, I've been working in this area of particular solids for over 30 years. But it's this journey about trying to turn fundamental research at university into industrial application. So that that journey and that process is the uh, one the focus that I'm going to uh, try to attempt to do today. Um, okay. Slide. Okay. Right. So. Yes, so I think as with this audience, I think it's well aware that over 80% of industrial feedstock are particulates in the form of powders, granules, celery, and paste. And there's ample examples in the literature report from industry, industry that there's significant problem uh, in, in effective processes of particulate solids leading to loss in productivity and poor product quality. So I've listed three of them here. The 40% loss in particular handling capacity due to poor design in silos and hoppers. And the, uh, the pharmaceutical industry have reported that on average, 10% of very expensive ingredients are rejected because we could not handle that manufacturing process to the, uh, to the correct uh, quality control. And in milling, which are a big part, you know, consumes 5% of global energy, and it's probably only under 1% efficient, I was being reminded. So this, in this uh, world of uh, you know, global energy crisis, there is really a role for uh, no, the uh, yeah, particular technologies and, and people working in this area to bring about the disruptive change, I think, in industrial practice. And it's needless to say that the market for particular products is enormous in Europe and worldwide. So modeling uh, has been increasingly employed as a method to inform and accelerate that the development of particular products and processes. 
And really, in recent decades, significant advances have been made. Um, and there's this group of methods called DEM, um, and also across the different length scales. All right, and so today I want to kind of briefly kind of review a very few slides on this, uh, what's been happening in that field, and then focus on, on one example where in Edinburgh, we go about trying to create a conceptual model uh, for industrial application. So because despite all these technological advances, both in the modeling sector, you know, the, among the modeling and mathematical and computation modeling colleagues, actually very few, relatively few academic particle-based processing models have been translated into industrial practice. So there's really a real need to bring about that impact and success is to try to, to exploit that value of the research. So I've got two slides on, on DEM, so discrete element method, which initially refers to a group of methods that, that uh, models uh, particles at individual particle level, right? Um, but it's progressively now turned into one major method which has now turned out to be the dominant one. And I will touch on that in, in these two slides. So by modeling at individual particle levels, it allows the underlying mechanics of the particle to be captured. And the goal is really to then inform the industrial process of interest, which is about scale. So I've got the diagram here that, uh, you know, our interest is on the right. So we want to optimize the design, you know, want to improve the product quality, and this is all at the bulk industrial level. And yet, the mechanics of where it's coming from come from the particle level. And between that, the particle, as Professor uh, Poletto had pointed out, they as aggregates and agglomerate. So they form this meso intermediate length scale uh, structure, which actually is the one that drives the industrial about processes. So I have my last statement here that DEM prediction is not simply modeling a particle level, but it's to understand that we capture the physics at the particle level, but it allows us to really interpret the information across a very vast range of length skills that we have to encounter and have to solve in order to provide solutions at the industrial level. So micro to meso to power scale. And I will be touching on that also. Uh, so I think those understanding over the last few decades has been very instrumental, I think, in that this is no longer a scientific tool. Uh, it should be uh, something that, that we should encourage industry to take on seriously as a way of uh, addressing innovation needs in the industry. So I've said just now that DEM you know, it's modeling uh, particle level motion, soft, simple equations of motion at uh, contact level. But uh, with the recent advances, you can use it for more you know, looking at breakage, adhesion, and liquid effects, and so on. So the first, probably the most cited paper with over 11,000 citations is the paper of Kander and Strzok in Geotechnique in 1979. And basically, if two particles come into contact, then we have, of course, contact stiffness for calculating the force. And then we have some kind of friction to account for part friction. And then we have some kind of dashboard for dissipation through coefficient restitution. So that gives us the classical DM model for a coefficientless solid, right? With a stiffness, friction, and restitution for energy dissipation. Now, over the last few decades, we say that, okay, particle shape is important because interaction, you know, granular friction come a lot from shape interaction and that they're now in existence, both in academic and commercial codes, uh, ellipsoidal, multi-sphere, polyhedral, superquartic. So all sorts of shapes are now possible to try to increase that fidelity of the model. There are also a lot of more advanced content models to capture the complex particle phenomena. So you got elastoplastic, adhesion, and bonded. I'm going to pick up this uh, uh, cohesive solid uh, as the example today. All right. So from simple particle problem to complex problem through coupling with a uh, you know, fluid dynamics through CFD with uh, with a uh, you know machine through uh, multi body dynamics and so on. So there are lots of examples. I'm not going to dwell on this um, that uh, you will see in many different application since particles appear, particle size appear in so many different sectors. So there's a vast range of application that people are trying to use, to use it for. So this is kind of a summary slide to say that we, in DEM, we calculate the particle scale data. We look at the positions, the forces, the dynamics, the kinematics, 
and the contact history, lots of information at particle level. Our interest is outside this circle. We want to use that to inform fluidization, inform pneumatic conveying, inform breakage, inform this and that. So they, and so this interpretation of information is key to try to drive, to, to address industrial problem. And I say at the bottom that you couple with the, uh, the fluid dynamics for particle fluid multiphase system and machine dynamics and so on. So there's a very vast range and many examples, both in scientific applications are also in industrial application. Now, so since this talk is about industrial applications, so if you want to apply to industrial problem, then you need to uh, you need to be answering this. How do I turn my DEM into a predictive modeling? Meaning that you can establish the degree of predictive capability of your model as compared with a real industrial uh, system, right? And if you are from any of the co co modeling community, whether in the CFD or in the FEM, where the, uh, you know, in the modeling of the continuum, uh, where the, uh, um, I think the, the technology are a lot more mature, maybe 30, 40 years more mature than DM. Um, and there you will see that, okay, you have to first, you know, go through a process of conceptualization and you define the problem for the intended application, which is the reality of interest. And then you go through a math conceptualization to say that what is my model? What is my mathematical model? And then you go through a code implementation where, and then a verification to check whether are we implementing the model correctly. So you have conceptualization uh, to achieve the, the model of your, of your intended problem. And then you verify that the model is implemented correctly. And then you go to validation. And this is about, are we implementing the correct model? If the material is cohesive, do you have cohesive uh, contact in there? If the model is plastic, do you allow plasticity to take place? So these are uh, about validation in, uh, by comparing with experiments to establish the predictive capability. And I think, if anything, in the field of uh, particle processes in the modeling of it, there is a lack of robust conceptualization. Um, we tend to take a pick up model and use it, and also validating it for intended application. Um, so I think for I've got uh, uh, one example where I'm just going to go through the journey we've been through in order to try to uh, to go through that process to share with that. Now. Uh, more recently, uh, we have been approached by uh, CPI, the Center for Process Innovation in the UK, to, as their knowledge partner to, to take on this MMPP project uh, with the industrial partners. No, uh, actually, this one is in medicine manis manufacturing. Um, so it's a twin school white granulation for manuf manufacturing and medicine. And the, the, uh, the idea is really that they want to encourage adoption of particle-based modeling. And they're asking us, together with Sheffield, to provide that, to work with uh, the software providers, the industrial end user partners, to work towards um, something that could encourage standardized process, something that we can build on. And we ended up with this generic framework for model-driven design, with a lot of input from industry and from the software providers as to what the process is really like. So while I've described these three steps in achieving path towards predictive modeling by saying that, you know, go through a conceptualization process, capture your key physics, and then verify that you have the model implemented correctly, validate again a real experiment that you have captured, capture it, and that is the process. But when we talk to the industry, it's very clear that actually the process of conceptualization is, which is the model definition stage, is really not yet not that simple, really. Because very often the problem that the uh, the uh, you know the product engineer or or you know they 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 what they want to achieve is not something that you can directly predict. All right. So so there's a step just before conceptualization, which is a, a very complicated plot here. But um, so I'm not not don't have time to go into detail. So my intention is not go into a lot of detail, but just to point out the different phases of going through it. So the first phase is really about, about linking your target product quality into what the CQA is, you know, the, the, quality, the critical attributes that you can predict and understanding that what your model is predicting 
actually have a very clear path towards delivering a certain, a certain target profile that you're trying to achieve. And that really a process requires, you know, different, uh, lots of different people to be involved and can be a very productive process for the company involved because suddenly you can see what is the mechanics and physics that's driving your, your manufacturing system. And you can then see that there is a way of predicting it that can provide that more, uh, more um, um, that that uh, to, that address the problem that you might be facing. So there's a so there's three stages here to summarize a model uh, definition stage and then the model def, uh, uh, verification stage and then following eventually by doing the modeling and the validation on the per product basis. Um, so so that set of there's a series of tasks if you like. So I, this the that complicated picture kind of summarize here onto the steps. So initially identify the critical quality attributes that, that relates to your target profile, product profile that you want to achieve. And you, you, you kind of go through that. And then you ask the question, is the optical particle model for a process, has it been identified? And that's conceptualization. Is it feasible? Then this point of decision where you say that, are you going to proceed? Is that the right level? of fidelity for your industrial process. It's a chosen model and process implemented correctly. So if it's agreed that it's to proceed, then go to a model verification. And once verified, then the system characterization to provide the, uh, the model attributes and the process attributes that you require to do the modeling. Um, and then you can then have parallel experiments, validation experiments for comparison. And that whole process leads to a, a validated uh, model uh, to implement the model-driven design. Okay, in Edinburgh, we we uh, I uh, you know initially we did a lot of modeling and physical experiments, like one to one, to try to understand. So there's a set of work from from a, some of my former PhDs students that we we went through lots of process of learning what DM can do, what the strength, what are weaknesses. And uh, and they provide a very good I think literature on that uh, on that basis. But for today, I'm going to for the rest of the time, um, I um, I'm going to just focus on one, which is the modeling modeling of the cohesive powders in industrial application. All right. So I think that's a uh, just to go through that 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 process of conceptualization. And how do we, uh, yeah, what do we do to try to push it towards? Uh, a, a predictive model for industrial application. So first of all, conceptualization about conceptualizing bulk cohesion. Now in the first talk, Professor Paletto have indicated very, very well that a lot of the measurement in the, uh, you know, relates to the development of cohesion for powders under a state of consolidation, right? So, so that, that actually make it a lot easier here. So where does the cohesion bulk cohesion arise from. And again, Professor Palato have, have kind of pointed out that there's wonderful forces uh, and, and that uh, especially significantly much larger than the weight as the particle size reduces, there's electrostatic type forces. There's also solid and liquid bridging related forces happening. Um, a lot of uh, literature on that also, it could also arise from, from void uh, pressure that might be in existence. And uh, for a long time, uh, the, uh, the uh, elastic adhesive contact models such as JKR and DMT have been very, very popular. They've been used to model cohesive powders. And what, what we have realized, I think, in more recent years is that these models have difficulty in capturing the stress history dependency and this over-consolidated behavior as seen in experiment as uh, you know, Professor Massimo Poletto have have kind of explained just now in the set of Janicki plots and so on. And, and quite simply that if you compress a, a cohesive powder, for example, in your hand, you press it together, it sticks together and form a lump. And that is the cohesion developing. If you press it harder, then it develops a stronger cohesion uh, when you remove all the stress. And those are uh, the stress history dependence. It depends on the historical loading that your powder has been subjected to that give rise to the cohesive strength that it has when you're trying to make it flow, right? So to summarize that, so this is one example, for example, of a real experiment 
uh, where where this uh, gypsum powder has been compressed in the con in, in under 40 kPa consolidation for one minute. You peel off the load, all the load in a, in a uni exit tester without any loading and load it vertically to failure. Then it goes through, you know, rising to a maximum uh, force uh, before it fail, and then it kind of over consolidated, drop off in an over consolidated manner. And what we of course say is that this maximum um, unconfined strength, subject to the historical forty kPa loading previously, have given rise to this cohesive strength. And again, in the previous talk, you hear about the flow function. So you can define this uh, unconfined yield strength as a function of the historical consolidation stress that gives rise to the strength. Now, it's clear that if the DEM is model is going to be doing capturing, you know, going to be useful for industrial processes, it must reproduce this. Because in many of the industrial processes, we subject our material to a, a set of loading. So in silos, in, in mixer, you place the material in there and the material is placed under its own weight and it consolidates. And whether it's going to flow, how it's going to flow is dependent on that level of stress and the degree of the cohesive strength it developed as a result of consolidation. So it's very clear to us that, that uh, uh, this is the first thing that we have to try to capture. Now, before we began to develop that model, this is a, uh, um, I was uh, very troubled by um, by reading the literature about this, that, that we know the equation for wonder wall force, capillary force, electrostatic force very well. So this, and there's lots of different examples. And I think this paper by uh, Sabre, Jonathan Sabo and his co-workers is a good illustration of that. So that if you look at the scientific equation for capillary wonder wall forces, and you plot it as a function of particle size, this one is in microns, then the theory says that wonder wall forces, capillary forces increases as a function of particle size. So that is the theory. That's what happens. Um, and when you when when uh, when we try to when people try to measure in laboratory, they find that they can't find it. Measurement doesn't show that it's increasing in this fashion. So if anything, you saw the dashed line here. So this is a dashed line. And if you know if you try to measure in laboratory, very often people measure that these forces actually do not change significantly as a function as the particle size gets larger. And the reason is because the magnitude of the adhesion could, can, can be large, but the effective range is very small. The range of these forces coming to play is in nanometers, but the particle's roughness, the surface asperity is of that order of magnitude. And that means that the theoretical forces that we calculate can doesn't really come into play in the real life. So I have this final statement here that modeling particle contact adhesion, which is done a lot in DM by DM colleagues or so, which is based on particle radius, which smooth the sphere, which is a DM classical DM approach, can be wrong for real solids because of surface roughness. And, and that is kind of shown by the experiment. So this leads to our the model that we propose that. So we understand that when two particles come together in a DM, it needs to be informed by particle level physics, such as wonder wall forces and so on. You also need to capture that stress history dependency that if you compress particles together, the, the surface uh, energy increases somehow or, or, or surface contact area increases, leading to an increase in the cohesion of the, of the, of the bulk solid. And our goal is to develop this micro the meso level adhesion model that can reproduce this, the bulk cohesive strength, right? So it did in this picture here, we recognize that we want to model, capture the particle phenomena because that's why, because that's important. Uh, and that's the phenomenon that, that drives the industrial process. We understand that there's some kind of agglomeration that could be happening at meso scale. But at the end, we like to be able to predict the bulk strength. So, you know, again, in the previous talk, uh, you saw the uniaxial test, and indeed, that was the one that we adopted. So if you compress it with a certain known consolidation stress of, say, 40 kPa, you peel it off in this way, uh, we like the model to be able to capture the strength in the bulk strength, but through a particle contact level. And by having calibrated that for a measured uh, cohesive flow function, then we can apply to the industrial process out there. So that's the approach we have taken. Um, 
Okay, so this is the model. So, so when two particles come together in the force uh, 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 overlap in the DM model, we recognize that if it's in the fine powder, there'll be a JK Wonderwall type forces uh, that come to existence. And that's the F0 term in the model. As the particle has been compressed to closer together, then the contact compressive force starts to develop. And we recognize that that could be linear and non-linear. So there's got an exponent n to that. So if n is 1.5, then there's a Hertz, uh, Hertz contact. If it's one, then it will be a linear contact. But we also say that as con particles being compressed together, contact, the overlap is not just elastic. It must have elastic and plastic overlap. So that leads to uh, uh, unloading uh, uh, on the K2 stiffness and resulting in a uh, contact plasticity delta P, which is a function of that uh, the K1, K2, that is that governs the, uh, the adhesion at the contact level. So in summary, we now have a model that says that as the particles come together, we, we expect a wonderful type force to start to appear, but as they compress further together, that the contact plasticity gave rise to a change in, um, in the cross-section area and that plastic contact and together with the surface energy uh, at the contact drives the total adhesion at the contact level. All right, so we are going to now test out. So in the linear, if you re remove non-linearity, it becomes a linear model. And uh, yeah, uh, Subhash Thakul and JP Morrissey, my former PhD student, they, they've done a lot of work in this area. You can look, for, look them up in the literature. Okay, so the first thing is to validate it at the at the uh, test level. So Professor Paletto mentioned about Uniaxa tester. So we have one, the one Edmund powder tester, which was adopted into the Freeman UPT tester, where we are trying to achieve a uniform compression from the top and the bottom uh, through a floating base. And that allows a more accurate measurement under Uniaxa tester. And you can see that you apply the loading to it in this in, and then you under consolidation, you then uh, take off the consolidation and then you load it to failure. Uh, it's a test is very simple, highly repeatable, very quick, and then it leads to a fail sample. Um, and we can now plot the consol the uh, the unconfined strength as a function of consolidation. And that's what we have in this example on the validation of our the the cohesive the EPA model, the Edinburgh elastic plastic adhesive model. Okay, so. You apply different loading, so to 20 kPa, and that gives rise to a uh, um, the unconfined yield strength, the peak of the loading curve, as a function of the consolidation pressure, and that gives us our flow function, as uh, Professor Poletto had pointed out. Um, and this one actually is in a, a, in a project uh, sponsored by uh, LKB in Sweden, so it's on the iron ore finds. So this has got four percent moisture. So you can see here that. Um, that is the uh, the experiment for 4% moisture. Now, if you vary the moisture, because moisture is part of the industrial process as the, as the moisture level of the iron ore finds changes, then you can measure all these different levels of um, the cohesion defined by the unconfined strength as a function of consolidation. So the challenge for the model is whether can it predict this uh, by simply using uh, surface energy, right? So this is our model, our, our attempt at checking that the model is working. Okay, so I, I don't think the details is that important here. We carry out the DM model of the of the Unix tester, the Edinburgh powder tester. We fill it, then we load it up under a known wood consolidation in a confined cylinder. Then we peel it, and then we load it to failure. And we are measuring this failure strength uh, as a function of consolidation stress. And this is what we get. So plotted here, uh, the solid, uh, solid symbol is the DM prediction. So this one is uh, for the iron ore finds. And the empty one is from the experiment, the flow function from experiment uh, at 1% uh, moisture. So this, the only, only thing that changed is the surface energy at contact, which is set at 8. So it's a calibration process. So when the moisture increases to 2%, we propose that the surface energy have changed and, and that has gone up, slight, gone up slightly and that matches it and so on. So it seems to work that 
by uh, you know saying that the moisture level can be related to the surface energy characteristic, we can reproduce the full set. Uh, and that gives us a model that can then be applied to an industrial process, a complex industrial process. Okay, so that, that seems to, so that gives us confidence that, that it can work. Um, and uh, then to, at that point, I think this is uh, the, uh, one of the major equipment manufacturer approaches and say that they really like to apply this model. So we had then a new industrial project in which in earth moving, where we are asked to try to apply the model to the excavation in clay. Now clay is under two microns in size. So clearly we're not going to model it at two microns because it'd be billions and billions of particles. So we have to be looking to scaling laws but luckily in DM, because it's fundamentally correct, right? It's modeling at particle level. So it's very clear that you go back and look at the, con the, uh, the mechanics of particle, particle contact, uh, contact mechanics. Then you can work out exactly if you were to scale up, saying that I'm going to now use uh, uh, no, a five millimeter sphere to represent clay of two microns, that I know exactly how I have to scale up uh, my forces. So my, some of you will be familiar that the wonder wall force uh, need to be, Ram's law, for example, need to be scaled to the square of the particle dimension, whereas the loading stiffness uh, need to be scaled to the particle dimension D. So the, all the scaling laws are, are based on fundamental theories. And, you, and the example here at the below, you can see here that you can do confined compression, unconfined compression, or cone penetration, which is a, a method that is very popular in some industry as a way of measuring uh, the, uh, the shearing resistance, that the two curve, uh, one is for five millimeter uh, DM particle, one is scale up to 75 millimeter, and they produce exactly the same response, which is a clay response. Okay, so, so the scaling law worked for quasi-static regime. Now, this company actually is more about excavation in soil. And that there's a dynamic regime that they're working in. Um, but luckily, again, in the field of particle mechanics, there's a, a good awareness that, that we can make use of initial number to achieve the right uh, dynamic, to achieve in similar dynamic regime, right? So the example here, what I've got is that uh, um, the, uh, there's an example with a DM particle of 30 millimeters, one with 75 millimeters, and if you were to produce it at 0.9 meter per second, then they produce different prediction, the blue line uh, and the uh, red line, right? For the larger, part, larger particle. And this is because they are not in the same, you're not comparing the same dynamic regimes. So we, if you want to compare the same, then you have to make use of some kind of, uh, 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 um, making sure that they match the, the right regime. So initial number provides that, so once you scale it on based on initial number, then you could then produce a green line, which says that it can work too. So that allows us to now uh, have the right scaling laws for uh, quasi static, for cohesive force, for spring force, for different flow regimes. And it provides a, a result where uh, we are able to show this uh, industrial uh, big large company that although we're using 75 millimeter sphere, it behaves like clay, um, so, which is quite satisfying that these are very large particles, but it can behave like clay because it's been scaled properly to capture the scale and the, the clay behavior. Okay, so the model could be applied to, uh, to of course, different processes, and, and silo discharge is one where, where the cohesion does induce additional fluctuation. So you can look at the different, how the cohesion level in the solid could affect the flow pattern. These are only colored to show the flow patterns. So as you increase the cohesion, the flow become intermittent uh, and the flow rate slow down due to particle cohesion. Eventually there's a cohesive arching that happens. Um, and what's even more interesting is that, uh, um, that if you were to, uh, to, to turn the particle information, um, so I'm going to pause it, into what we are more interested in. So in silo, for example, so what I've got shown here, I'm just taking the particle, uh, in, you know, particle position, velocity, particle contact forces, and calculate the solid fraction, the porosity, the uh, velocity, the stress that appear 
and it, both in the horizontal, it's the S-X-X direction and the vertical direction. And you can see here that, that this is where well, I was you know, saying just now that the importance of doing DM simulation is to understand that, that while the phenomenon is driven at particle level, what we are interested in, what is really important for industry are the bulk level phenomena. And you could see here, it's very, very exciting that from the DM simulation, you can capture this increase in horizontal stress, for example, which we have measured in the experiment, right? That uh, there's uh, that as you open up outlet, there's this fluctuation of the uh, uh, of the discharge pressure with the horizontal wall pressure going through fluctuation, and the DM can very easily um, showing that that is actually larger than during the filling state. So you could see on this uh, horizontal stress, there's this intermittent arching giving rise to larger stresses where the transition is just above the, trans the, the internal hopper transition. So lots of very relevant phenomena uh, providing very useful insight to the uh, using DM and that understanding that, that uh, you really need to be working out what happened at the bulk level also. But these are information from DM. Okay, so that brings me to uh, uh, just a conclusion to say that uh, just to reflect on what I've discussed, that there's a critical first step often when trying to apply uh, modeling to industrial problem is to define the problem and coming up for a fit for purpose conceptual model and, and for the key underlying mechanics. And this is best achieved with collaborative effort from product design team, process operational team, the modeling team involving, you know, and those who are experts in DM particular mechanics. Really, it's, a, it's very much a joint effort. And I've learned a great deal by working on uh, in a collaborative project with industrial partners that, that uh, this process of iteration is a very important one. And there's therefore great opportunities, I think, for collaboration through research to achieve that. Uh, validation, uh, my second reflection is that it's really needed to establish the predictive capability of DEM. And the major advances already, you can see a lot of work from universities in uh, different computational techniques and now different data AI techniques also. But experimental management is lagging behind, is really much needed to, to try to achieve predictive modeling. And there's really a real need for this joint approach to try to, uh, in simulation and careful experimentation, um, experimentation to support uh, industrial innovation. Um, and so I'm just acknowledging that the clear this work come from a whole group of uh, you know, co-workers and colleagues working together over the years. Um, and I acknowledge that um, I'm just here presenting really the results from everyone and my acknowledgement to the funding bodies and to the industrial uh, sponsorship for this work. Finally, one last slide is to say that um, there's a car we are currently uh, uh, running a, a, a to say Mercury ITM where we are attempting you know, to move from fund fundamental DM research to industrial application. So this one is just really in the initial phase. So um, and it's training an upscaling part of the system uh, to understand this length scale towards achieving industrial uh, prediction. Um, and it aims to, to establish what I, we talk about physics based modeling through DM and then bridging the gaps between this micro mechanics that really under drive our industrial system, but to, to scale it up to industrial scale. Um, and that's uh, very exciting to have this opportunity to have 15 you know, uh, ES uh, fellows working in these interactive projects around Europe involving 15 academic industrial partners as listed below. And um, the information and possibility to uh, participate as, as an external participant uh, um, in the coming year. So get in touch if you're interested. And on that note, thank you for listening. Thank you very much, Jane, for this uh, wide overview on these uh, powerful modeling methods. And of course, uh, uh, as always, the challenges uh, are very interesting for the future development of uh, research. And so now we have uh, time for uh, some questions. We have uh, uh, one question already. Uh, the others could uh, type it in the meanwhile. Uh, is uh, as follow, uh, CFD is many years ahead of DM. 
How many years do you think it will, be, will take until DM is used as often and as effectively in industry as CFD? Yeah, I, I, I remember that, that years ago, you know, uh, we were asking that sort of questions. And, we were, and, and, and I suppose one of the questions is really that how far behind is, uh, is DEM compared with CFD, for example, which is now by now well established and used not just for scientific, but a lot for also for industrial type application. And we worked out that it's probably 30, 40 years. Uh, and uh, yeah, so we could see here that it compared with that like time scale. Um, but I think, I think it depends on, but research is accelerating. That's why I really want to say here that I think this, uh, that compared with the way that we work, and uh, for example, under um, um, the uh, you know Horizon Europe initiative, which is a huge big program, it allows a lot of potential interaction. Plays such a key role. So a lot of what we have achieved, and you could see here in Edinburgh in our group, we have benefited a lot. I'm extremely grateful for all this European collaboration, and to, and it really have drive the agenda. So although, so to answer the question, although it's, I say that in terms of the time as to when it appears is 30 years behind, but the acceleration, and for example, the, uh, the initiative under you know, uh, Horizon 2020 and now Horizon Europe has really played a major role that allows us to accelerate. So a lot of the discovery, and I think European research have really played a major role in pushing that, accelerating that front. So I'm optimistic. And I'm optimistic in terms of what we can do by working together. Thank you very much, Jean, for this uh, positive uh, outlook. We need this, of course. Um, so I don't know if there are any other question. Till now we we don't. So. Just take the opportunity to ask the question to the speaker now, if uh, if you want. Um, differently, you may want also to contact uh, our speaker uh, uh, later by uh, writing an email to them. They are, uh, I'm sure, uh, quite available uh, to uh, reply to your uh, doubts and curiosity, and uh, every possible also. Uh, interaction and uh, collaboration on the work uh, ground. So with, uh, mm, with this, I want to uh, thank again uh, uh, Massimo and Jean for uh, these uh, uh, fascinating uh, uh, lectures on uh, uh, two different uh, uh, sides of the same uh, uh, subject that are uh, perfectly complementary uh, and uh, of course this uh, maybe will open uh, some uh, uh, new question uh, and uh, possible search of answer by by the audience uh, in uh, today uh, so for this I, I thank again also the our uh, colleagues of the european federation of uh, chemical engineering uh, to to whom i leave the the closure of the spotlight talk so professor Cluzan and professor Pu. I want to, to just uh, close the, 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 the meeting uh, for today and maybe give um, for, um, uh, introduce also the, the other appointments that will be uh, the other meeting that will be in the following days uh, in the uh, program of the Spotlight Talk. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs>